So, if everything goes well, I'll talk uh, the first hour about uh, the wave equation on Kerr, and then uh, switch to talking about uh, spin geometry and uh, material which I think is relevant for higher spin fields. Um, and also for understanding the, the, the symmetries of, of the Kerr spacetime. Uh, and so this would be uh, ex extremely impressionistic, uh, and, uh, and uh, it will, maybe I'll, I'll, I can give some flavor of the techniques that I have been working on. Uh, and and uh, if you, to go into full detail, it's, it's not really, uh, I think it's not really that useful. Um, and I, I, will, uh, f I will be talking only about uh, not Fourier-based techniques. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there are other techniques which, which are, are also extremely important, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which have been used by the Fermos and Rodiansky uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, Schlapp and Koth Rothman recently uh, on, uh, to prove uh, things about large A, uh, so for, for essentially arbitrary uh, sub-extreme Kerr spacetimes. <coughs> um, so, uh, but, so, so, I ha so we had this picture, so on the one hand, we look at the, the black hole from, from the side, uh, there is this region, uh, this ergo region, where the, the time-like vector field becomes space-like. Uh, there is the, the photon region, where we have trapped null geodesics. And if we look at the causal picture, it's something like this. Uh, and so here is the, the photon region. And near here is the the ergo region, and at least for for small a, uh, these are these are separated. Uh, and uh, what what is important to understand is that is that uh, light packets or wave packets of high frequency can track null geodesics. This is not difficult to understand. And, uh, and so that means that uh, these trapped null geodesics correspond to, so, so trapping or, uh, so by trapping I, I refer to these, uh, these trapped or rotating null geodesics. This is, this is, uh, this is a high frequency. And, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the aspect that's relevant for the wave equation that comes from, from the ergo region uh, uh, this is related to uh, what's known as superradiance. And this is a, uh, this is a low frequency. So, so not only, if we look at these pictures, not only are these uh, regions where we have trapping and, and superradiance, or, or the ergo region, not only are they separated in the space-time, but they're also in some sense separated in frequency space. And so one can hope to deal with these uh, phenomena separately. Uh, <coughs> And uh, and uh, just to just to just to illustrate uh, uh, what's going on, if if suppose that you were to try to uh, apply Fourier techniques, which I'm not going to do, uh, what you would try to do is is you would observe that 
that, uh, that the wave equation, so we have this So we have this expression for the, for the radio potential of, of, of null geodesics. And uh, I forget if I wrote this down uh, explicitly, but, it, uh, but uh, le let me write it uh, in, well, OK. So let me write it a bit later. Uh, and, and corresponding to that, we have this expression for the wave equation. And now this R here is, is an expression involving dt, d phi, and an operator q. And this operator q corresponds to the conserved quantity that's known as the Carter constant. Uh, <coughs> and uh, and uh, this, this Carter constant corresponds to the total angular momentum. Uh, so if, we, if you go to Schwarzschild, then you would do separation of variables using uh, the, the time frequency and the, ang and the eigenvalues of the spherical Laplacian. And that, would cor that corresponds to going to spherical harmonic modes. And if you go to non-zero A, then you have uh, spheroidal harmonics, uh, which are eigenvalues. So th this is the, the usual. Uh, So this is, this is an operator that's essentially the same operator I wrote down yesterday. And, and it, let's call its eigenvalues like that. <coughs> so these, these eigenfunctions are spheroidal harmonics. And if I set m to be the azimuthal angular frequency uh, and set a to 0, then these are just spherical, uh, spherical harmonics. Uh, And so then you can make a separated ansatz uh, like that. So now we have already uh, optimistically taken a Fourier transform, or just we just make this ansatz for a separated mode. And a priori, this omega is a complex number. But if, you, if you're in a situation where you can actually do Fourier, uh, a Fourier transform, then this omega can be taken to be real. m is the, this azimuthal angular frequency. And, 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 and we have two separated pieces, one r-dependent and one theta dependent. <clears throat> and then we can uh, use this, uh, this eigenvalue of this spheroidal Laplacian as a separation constant. And, uh, and uh, after going to uh, tortoise coordinates, which in this case are given by this Uh, this expression. Now, if we, uh, so I, I, I can, I, by going to, by using this as a separation constant in the wave equation, uh, I can, uh, I can get rid of these. I can rid, get rid of the theta dependence and hide that, because this this operator, as it stands in the wave equation, here. Uh, contains all the theta dependence. There is no explicit theta dependence in this, uh, in this term, script R. Uh, and, uh, and let me write it uh, 
So, well, I won't write it. I mean, uh, but it's, it's, it, it has those properties. And let's not worry about the, the details. Uh, uh, and so if we go to this, this uh, tortoise coordinate, uh, in, introduce a function, uh, f new, a new function phi, which is this r so, uh, suppressing now the, the, all these indices. Uh, and uh, doing a rescaling like that, then uh, we can write the equation that, that remains in this potential form. And this V here is a potential that, that appears from this script R. Uh, and, uh, and I'm suppressing the dependence on all these, parameters, on these uh, indices and parameters here. But the, the crucial property is that uh, this has And this, this omega h here is the rotation speed of the black hole. So this is a over r plus squared plus a squared. Uh, and so this, has, this is a potential that has, that has uh, different limits at, so this is the plus infinity, and this is the minus infinity limit for, for the tortoise coordinate. Uh, and uh, now, so now, we have reduced uh, to a second order ordinary differential equations with a bunch of parameters. Uh, and if you look at uh, such equations, you have the fact that the Vronskian is conserved. Uh, so uh, we can make an ansatz for this phi. Uh, as, as r goes to plus infinity, uh, we make it look like uh, and as r goes to the horizon, so r star goes to minus infinity, uh, it goes like e to the minus i uh, like that. Okay, and uh, now the fact that the the there is a Vronskian here which is conserved. Uh, Or es essentially, this is also saying that uh, that uh, the energy flux uh, through R equals constant hypersurfaces, the energy flux per unit time, uh, uh, is conserved. Uh, this implies the following relation. Uh, And uh, so what I, what I should have said here is that uh, this, this here, this amplitude here corresponds to ingoing. Yeah, so uh, I went too fast. So, so here uh, at infinity, we have a superposition of ingoing and outgoing modes. Remember that this is space-like infinity. And at the horizon, we have purely ingoing uh, modes. And, uh, and, and so this, 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 uh, this mode uh, uh, consists of, of uh, a superposition of ingoing and outgoing. And, 
And if, if we have the out amplitude of the outgoing wave, uh, part of the wave, larger than the amplitude of the ingoing wave, then this phenomenon is called superradiance. And uh, the, the, this conservation of the Vronskian for this second order OD leads to this relation after some calculation. And, uh, and what you see then is that in order for the superradiance to hold, well, the condition is that omega minus m omega h is less than zero. So if we suppose that the frequency omega is positive, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the horizon is supposed to be, uh, uh, an, uh, this is a null surface, and, and no radiation is supposed to be able to pass out of that due to the, I mean, here, any radiation that tries to escape from here is infinitely redshifted. So this is, I mean, this is my vague explanation. I don't buy this argument completely, but... Um, This is this is this 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 refers to uh, modes on such a surface. But in principle, you, you what you would what what you could try to do is to do the analysis in that setting, and then then of course here you would uh, not ex you 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 would at automatically exclude any ingoing modes. So I'm, I'm just giving this as as a background, so to speak. Uh, just to motivate this, uh, in, in some vague sense, this statement that, that the ergoradian and superradiance have to do with low energy, low frequency. Uh, and, and so this, this is somehow, this is talked ab about a lot in the literature. And so we see that, that the condition here is that The, that we, ha in order for the superradiance to hold whatever that actually means, because it's 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 a non-trivial uh, task to relate these statements to statements about finite energy waves, and in fact, uh, if you if you do numerical experiments where you try to cook up uh, a wave data for for a wave outside of the ergo region with finite energy, but arrange it so that the energy, the frequencies are localized in the superradiant regime, and you try to shoot it in, in uh, and see what comes out, uh, it uh, seems to be quite difficult to actually see uh, this effect of superradiance for such finite energy modes. So this, uh, so, so Istvan Raj and, and collaborators have have uh, done work on this, and 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 it's it still seems to be uh, somewhat unclear what's actually going on. So I think this is something that needs further uh, analysis. But this is just to motivate this idea that that uh, <coughs> that there is this, at least for small a, there is this separation between the the trapping and super and and the superradiant effects both in the space time and, and in, in frequency space. Sorry? This. The, this one here. Uh, well, I mean, so uh, the idea is that a general wave would be somehow uh, built up from a superposition of such things, right? So there would be a, a sum over m and l's, and then uh, uh, maybe an integral over over the, the frequency, and then you have these. So this is similar to to, to saying, um, uh, I mean, this this would be analogous to the Fourier decomposition of of, of a wave. Yeah, so, so, so simply, I mean, take, take uh, the wave equation on Minkowski space. 
and, 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 and do a Fourier transform, then, then you would be representing the wave uh, as a superposition of single frequency uh, waves. And this is an example of such a thing, right? So. No, no, but th this, these, are, these are what we're interested in are finite energy solutions of the wave equation, let's say, or nice, smooth solutions of the wave equation. But uh, s if we suppose that, that such a solution is, uh, is sufficiently well behaved that we can apply a Fourier transform in time, then we can represent it as the superposition of such objects here. Okay, well, we can talk about that later. Um, <coughs> and, and I should also mention, uh, without going into detail, that, that, um, that there is, there is a, a kind of classical work, 1989, uh, by Whiting, uh, that basically says that, that uh, if you look at such a separated mode, uh, then the frequency, this omega, has to be, uh, has the, the imaginary part of that has to have the right sign. By, and by right sign means uh, no exponential growth. Uh, but that's a, and that has been, that, that has been worked over uh, more recently by, by, uh, uh, by this, uh, by uh, the Fermos and collaborators, so to speak, um, and, and uh, extended to, so what Whiting did was for truly complex omegas, but that has now been extended to real omegas, which is the situation you would be in if you were able to, to take a Fourier transform. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and so I would also, I also need to say that, that if, if we look at the Cauchy problem in this setting, we also have the problem that, uh, that the, 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 the Boyer-Linquist coordinates are degenerate. So we, had to, we have to get rid of that problem by extending our solution up the horizon like this. But that's, uh, that's a, somehow a much less of a problem than these two problems that have to do with the superradiance and trapping. So the superradiance uh, or ergoradian means that we have no positive definite energy that's conserved. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so, uh, so I just want to say a few words about how one can, uh, how, how one can try to think about energy estimates um, and how, how, to, how those can be applied in this situation. So on, on Mikoski space, uh, you, have, uh, you have lots of symmetries. You have ten a 10-dimensional space of killing vector fields, a 15-dimensional space of conformal killing vector fields. Uh, and and uh, the corresponding energies uh, give you quite good control over the wave equation. And I mean, most, most uh, energy uh, arguments start with Gauss law. So here is, here is the space-time region bounded by sigma 0 and sigma 1, which has normal T A. And then uh, this is just Gauss law. And, and what, what we can try to do is to cook up such a P A, which depends on, uh, on our solution of the wave equation. in some clever way and, and try to make use of that identity. Uh, and, and so the, uh, if we take uh, 
so one important example is to take that contraction with the stress energy tensor and the vector field. And that gives a, a, a one form where, where we can apply uh, the Gauss law. And if we have a, uh, and if we have a solution <coughs> of the wave equation, then that means that uh, the stress energy is conserved. And let me write the stress energy is, again, That's the stress energy, and, and now we can compute simply because of this divergence, this conservation law for the stress energy, we have that okay. And uh, in fact, if we we uh, we can uh, uh, so. This is and and if so, if psi is time-like, uh, then that means that p a p a t a is essentially the energy. This this uh, controls essentially the energy density, uh, which is. So, uh, roughly speaking, unless you're in, unless your uh, your hypersurface is somehow degenerate, then then roughly speaking, if we have psi time like, then uh, the energy flux here that we get to integrate essentially controls the energy density for the field. So that means that we can we can do uh, uh, energy estimates. So this this energy density will be something like. Uh, like dt psi squared plus grad uh, psi squared, right? So this, this controls uh, derivatives of the field in all directions. And so once we, once we can estimate that and, all, and up to sufficiently high derivatives, then, then we can control the field uh, pointwise. And, and an example of, of uh, so uh, an, an example of uh, a result that comes out of this in Minkowski space uh, then what you can show is that uh, uh, something like this. So there, there, and then here we have some expression in involving initial data, and let uh, so this is so here I is some uh, uh, and basically what it is 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 an L two norm uh, of fields, conformal killing fields up to some order on the psi evaluated in L2. So this is the, this is the I. Uh, and we sum up for alpha less than or equal to some suitable K. So let me be very vague. But this, the idea is that from energy estimates, by using uh, sufficiently many, uh, yes? Huh? Um, ah, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. I, I, yeah, so this, I, I was, I, I should have used the brackets. <laughs> uh, something like that, yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, essentially this is uh, 1 over v, 1 over u to the 1 half. And v, uh, v and u are, uh, T plus R, T 
minus r, right? So, so what this means is that as I go out along the light cone, I have 1 over t decay. And, and in the interior, I have 1 over t to the 3 halves decay, roughly speaking. And of course, this is, in Minkowski space, this is a very, this is not uh, far from the optimal result because we have Huygens principle. So there is no, in fact, there is no tail. But this is, a, this is quite a robust result that holds uh, in, 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 a, in a wide situation. Uh, but this is just to illustrate uh, what you can get from such, uh, such energy estimates. And uh, now the problem is that in, in Kerr, uh, we don't have all the vector fields available. We have only two killing vector fields. And we have uh, higher order symmetry operators. And, uh, and so there's another type of estimate that's, that's very important. And this is the Moravitz estimate. And let me spend a few minutes Uh, so we need to have a, a slightly more flexible ansatz If you calculate the divergence of that uh, one form or vector, what you get is stress energy, uh, there is one term which is a nice square of derivatives. Uh, and there is one term which cannot have a sign. This is the, essentially the Lagrange density for the scalar field. This has a contraction with the Lorentzian metric, so this, this term cannot have a sign. And if you want uh, good control on this bulk term, this term has to be eliminated in some sense. Uh, and uh, if we take a vector field A, which is just that vector field, and now, in, uh, and now we're in Minkowski space, then uh, what you find is that uh, this, uh, this thing here is just so this is this is the, now G here is the Minkowski metric, and uh, this uh, symmetrized covariant derivative is just the Minkowski metric with indices up uh, plus the t squared. So this is contains most of the pieces of the Minkowski metric, except this, the, the, the minus the t squared piece is, is missing. Uh, and if you plug in and calculate, what you find is that in that case, this bulk term is equal to the energy density. So this means that if we go back to the to this energy identity, what I have here is, uh, is an in integral over space-time of the energy density. So I, I take the energy density on each t equals constant slice and integrate that in time. And, and here, on the boundary, I have the corresponding energy for this, the energy flux for this momentum, yes. Uh, sorry, sorry, yes. Uh, I should have, uh, sorry, thanks. Uh, 
Yeah, so, so now I, for this particular vector field, I, I compute this corresponding expression, OK? Uh, is that OK? Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm messing up, so thanks. So if I take that particular vector field and compute this, uh, this uh, symmetrized covariant derivative, this is what I end up with. And uh, that, then you can check that if you take this particular choice for the function q, then uh, the bulk term, this divergence, is simply proportional to the energy density. OK? It's just it's a calculation. It's, it's, it, takes a, it takes a few minutes. Uh, but but the, point, the point is that, and, and this is the classical Moravitz estimate uh, from around 1960. Uh, and ignoring problems, ignoring problems with this vector field at, at the origin, it degenerates um, at r equal to 0. And it, of course, grows at r equal to infinity. Uh, but what, what you can hope to get from such, such an argument is, is that uh, the, the bulk term, which in this case is the space-time interval of the energy density, is controlled by the initial and final energy. And since, in this case, we have a conserved energy for the wave equation, simply coming from the d by dt vector field, uh, that expresses the fact that, that the energy of the wave tends to leave stationary regions. So this is a very, uh, very important principle. Uh, So this 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 Moravitz this this gives something something like this that um, uh, that uh, the integral dt from let's say t zero to t or uh, t zero to t one and then integral over some region where R1 is less than R less than R2, some finite stationary region of the energy density is bounded in terms of data. This is the sort of thing that you can, you can hope to get from this. Uh, and what that means is that uh, there will be, there have to be times when this energy density becomes very, very small. And so this expresses the fact that, that, that energy for, for a wave, uh, if we have some initial data here, the energy for the wave tends to leave every stationary region. And what you expect to see left over is the tail. And the tail is then determined by the, the geometry of the space-time. And in a black hole space-time, uh, the tail is, is, is caused by backscatter of the wave from the, from the background curvature, so to speak. OK, so, so this is an extremely impo important principle. And, and, uh, and this, uh, this type of estimate can be used. Uh, if, we can, if we can prove such an estimate, it can be used to control error terms and so on in, 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 uh, in other uh, energy uh, identities. <clears throat> and you can do a similar calculation for for Maxwell. Uh, so if you look at Maxwell in Minkowski space, you can, as an exercise, do the same calculation. And uh, and there, of course, the stress energy tensor is trace free. So uh, if we ignore this. This uh, this additional part, then 
the fact that in the divergent, in this symmetrized covariant derivative of the A, the metric shows up. This means that this can be canceled, and what you have left over is the dt squared term. And when you contract that into the stress energy, that gives you the energy density for the Maxwell field. So, so you see immediately that, that this kind of argument also works for, for the Maxwell field. <coughs> okay, so, uh, but this, this, this type of relation cannot hold in, the, in, in a black hole space time because of this uh, trapping, the fact that you have trapping of null geodesics. And, and to illustrate that, uh, um, I, want to, I just want to do a, 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 a kind of model problem that shows um, where this is coming from in the Schwarzschild case. Okay, so, uh, so if you start with the, the wave equation in Schwarzschild uh, and introduce uh, uh, the tortoise coordinate R star as we had before, and uh, if we take uh, we do a rescaling of this, uh, uh, the unknown in the wave equation like that, and uh, simply calculate what you find is is that uh, is that uh, you end up with this following expression. So this is uh, instead of the wave equation, we have this expression here. And this, this V is a potential which uh, we don't really care about, but it's something like uh, V is, uh, let's see here, uh, uh, it's something like F over R3 times 2M. And F is that 1 minus 2M over R. Uh, Uh, yes, uh, let's see, oh, you're right. So, so we set phi to be r psi, sorry. Uh, and, and so this essentially, after doing this change of coordinate and the conjugation of the wave equation, we end up with this new equation. Uh, and uh, this potential, we can, well, let's ignore that because that, that will have only effect at low, energy, low frequency. Uh, and uh, what I want to understand is, is the trapping. And so this, this VL, which stands in front of the angular Laplacian, <coughs> is, is F over R, R squared. Okay. And that's the same uh, potential that showed up in the, in the uh, Hamiltonian for the radial motion of null geodesics in Schwarzschild. So this, this also sits inside the wave equation like that. And, so, and, and that has this typical behavior that it, 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 uh, it's zero at r equals 2m. It, it has an extremum. At, uh, at, at 3M and so on. 
So uh, in, in terms of the tortoise coordinate, here we have exponential decay uh, at the horizon, uh, at, at r equals minus infinity. Uh, OK. And, and so now, uh, if we do, if we look, uh, so let me call this L. Uh, so this is L phi. And let me introduce a multiplier. So uh, with all of these things that I, I did before can also be done as a multiplier uh, calculation. And this, this you can check as an exercise the relation between those divergence formulas for the momentum and, and, and these, uh, these formulas here. Uh, uh. So this is a this is a, a first order operator. This corresponds to the this vector field A. This corresponds to the lower order term that I called Q. Okay, uh, and uh, and if we take this and multiply the wave operator L with it, then we get ignoring uh, boundary terms. The, the, the important terms that we get are the following. Uh, I should have here, uh, this should all be tortoise R. So I'm, I'm ignoring some, some unimportant terms, including boundary terms. And, uh, and, but what you should see here is that uh, this is an expression which involves squares of first derivatives. And uh, what we would like to have in order to get a, a, a situation which is similar to the Moravitz estimate in Mikowski space, we want to have uh, some expression here that's, that has a good sign. And so in, uh, yes? <coughs> exactly, and, and, and up, to, up to boundary terms. So, so by boundary terms, I mean total derivatives. And I'm also ignoring things which involve this zeroth order potential V, right? But, uh, but the, the, the important part of the calculation is what you have here. And, uh, and so what, what we find is that if we integrate this over some space-time region, uh, this, this can be, this can have a sign only if, uh, uh, what we need is is f times dv uh, the r star has a sign and also minus the f the r star has a sign but uh, remember that this derivative here uh, if we look at this is the this is the graph of of the function uh, sorry this is this is not v this is vl So the graph of this potential that stands in front of the angular Laplacian uh, has a peak at r equals 3m. So the, the gradient of that changes sign. And uh, so that means that 
the only way we can hope to get this uh, relation is that uh, the function f, the, co the coefficient in the, in the vector field changes sign. And uh, this is the, this r equals 3m in Schwarzschild, this is the location of the, the trapped or rotating null geodesics. So this means that we have to have this relation that the vector field uh, has to be aligned so that it, it points away from, well, up to some sign, this, 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 uh, this vector field A equals, which is going to be F dr, this has to point away from the trapping. And uh, this, is, this is possible. You can arrange this to ha happen in Schwarzschild, but in Kerr, uh, due to the fact that the, the trap null geodesics have a location which depends on the conser conserved quantities, uh, 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 which you can only calculate in phase space. This means that, that uh, this, this kind of argument cannot work in Kerr. Okay. But um, so now, now I, I don't, I, I really don't, I'm not going to go into any, any details about this. But um, let me maybe go over a few minutes uh, just to finish this, this part. Uh, so remember that, uh, that if, we, if we look at, at the Kerr case, so, so this, 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 this kind of, argument has no chance to work in, in Kerr uh, if we use a classical multiplier or, uh, or a classical uh, vector, Moravitz vector field. Uh, and, and so the, there are two alternatives. Either you go to a Fourier-based argument where you, you, uh, you let your vector field essentially be not a, not a vector field on, on, on phase space, but a pseudo-differential operator. Uh, which has uh, phase space dependence, or you go to a, a generalized vector field which somehow involves the additional symmetries uh, of the of the of the curve space time, which are not vector fields but second order operators. Okay. <clears throat> and and so I'll just explain why that why that can work, so to speak. Okay, so, so recall that uh, we have, so now if we go to car, uh, we have this, This expression for for uh, for the wave equation, and uh, so this means that we have symmetry operators and by symmetry operators I, I, I mean an operator that takes solutions to solutions so for example in Minkowski space. A, uh, taking a lead derivative along a conformal killing field takes solutions of the wave equation to solutions of the wave equation because the, the commutator of that lead derivative with uh, the wave operator is, uh, is proportional to the wave operator itself. So the result when you apply to a solution of the wave equation is zero. Uh, so in, in Kerr we have these first order symmetry operators. And we also have second order symmetry operators. And these are uh, dt squared, dt, d phi, 
the phi squared and this additional operator q, which comes from the, the Carter constant. And, uh, and let, me let me denote those by S A. So these, are, uh, so these are symmetry operators, not for the covariant wave equation, but for this, this modified wave equation. Uh, you, you also have a corresponding set of symmetry operators for the covariant wave equation, but those are, have more complicated form and are, are more difficult to use. Uh, now, in order to use, in order to make use of these, uh, we need to polarize the, the stress energy. So, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, so let me, so. So, uh, so this is simply, I mean, uh, the TAB is quadratic in, in, in the field Psi. So that means I can make a bilinear, symmetric bilinear form by polarizing. And this is this formula. And then I can make, I can add some indices here by taking, by inserting SA Psi and SB Psi where these S and S B are such symmetry operators. Okay. And uh, now what you can try to do, now clearly, I mean, if, if psi is the solution of the wave equation and if, if uh, S A and S B are symmetry operators, then this will still be divergence free. So uh, this means that you can, you can now introduce a generalized vector field somewhat like that, so, or, or a generalized momentum. Um, so if we have, so let's say we have psi A, B, A, which is symmetric in these underlined indices, and Q, A, B, which is symmetric in the underlined indices then we can form uh, a generalized momentum by taking TA So it's simply the, the most naive generalization uh, that you can think of, essentially. Uh, uh, so, so this, yeah, so this is not correct. So this is simply the analog of that formula I had before. Uh, and here we have like that. So this is, this is a generalized momentum uh, using the fact that this uh, uh, stress energy version is divergence free. You can easily calculate the divergence formula for this. And uh, if we take now some A 
A, B, which is uh, F, A, B of R, D, R, and Q, A, B, which is Q, A, B of R, and just plug in and calculate, uh, what you find is that the integral over this uh, momentum, uh, or rather, the, this bulk term that we get now has a form somewhat like this. So here we have uh, radial derivative squared, time and angular derivative squared, and function squared. But these are pointwise norms that involve up to two derivatives of the field. Okay. So uh, and and these a, a u and v are scalar functions that are calculated from from the these uh, coefficients f and q. And so what you see here is that you have one piece which is going to be essentially related to r prime squared. So by cleverly, by somewhat cleverly choosing this, these coefficient functions f, we can get here an expression which involves the square of the derivative of the potential here, which will then have a sign. And this is analogous to the, to the effect, uh, to this fact here, that we, we can get, by choosing the coefficient function, we can get that coefficient function times the potential in the wave equation uh, to have a sign. This is the same fact. And this will then degenerate at, at the trapping. And the same here. This this expression here will degenerate. And uh, these terms can be controlled and shown to give a non-negative contribution by using a Hardy estimate. Uh, and so, so what we end up with is is an expression which controls all derivatives away from trapping and, uh, and which degenerates at the trapping. And this can then be used uh, to prove energy estimates in Kerr uh, by the following uh, trick. Uh, and so let me, let me just finish this. So this is, this is uh, there, there are lots and lots of details here which I'm completely hiding, but I think it's, it, it's, this is the important point that uh, if you go f away from Minkowski or a situation where you have no trapping to a situation where you do have trapping, you can still have a Moravitz estimate uh, away from the trapping. And so the failure of the Moravitz estimate goes together with this high frequency phenomenon, which is the, the, the trapping. And that's an, that's, un uh, that's an inescapable fact whenever you have trapping there will be some degeneracy like that. You can try to, you can get away from some part of it and you can basically recover, you know, like three halves derivatives uh, without a loss, but you cannot recover two derivatives or one derivative squared uh, without a loss in a, in a uniform manner. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> So the, so the final, uh, so the final uh, trick, so to speak, that, that one can try to apply in, in this situation is uh, based on this following observation that, uh, so, 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 we, so a, a major problem is that the T is not 
time lag in, in the ergo region. So, so this means that there is no positive definite conserved energy. Okay, so this is one of the one of the facts, and this has to do, as I explained, with the superradians. But um, but this the following vector field uh, this can be arranged. So if we arrange this this psi here is a cutoff function, uh, which has the following uh, form. So here is r equals r plus. And uh, here is uh, the rotation speed of the, of, the, of the black hole. So remember, omega h is a over r squared plus a squared, r plus squared plus a squared. So that's, uh, that's the rotation speed of the vector field of the, of the black hole. And if we make this psi constant, we can, uh, for, if we look at now for small a, and uh, I, we really haven't tried to make this kind of argument. Uh, we haven't tried to, to make this work for in general A, so I don't have an opinion whether that can work or not. Uh, uh, here is 3m. We make this constant, then cut it off in some region like that. Then this can be made to be globally uh, time-like. So we can use the corresponding energy for this uh, that's defined with respect to this vector field T chi. T chi. Uh, and uh, the problem is that this is not a killing field. It's a killing field here, and it's a killing field outside. But in this region, uh, it, it fails to be a killing field. And so there will be an error term. Uh, so if we take the corresponding energy, uh, which, uh, uh, which would be uh, T A B T chi uh, B and take, uh, or the, the corresponding uh, momentum and, and calculate its divergence, there will be an error term Uh, and uh, so if we call this R1 and R2, this will be supported in uh, R1 less than R less than R2. Uh, and uh, this, this error term will involve um, something like uh, dr psi, d phi psi. Okay. Uh, and and uh, so those those uh, derivatives uh, need to be controlled. And they can be dominated if we put this region away from the trapping by the, uh, this Moravitz density that we just constructed. And, and then for small a, you, get, uh, you, can, you can close the argument by, uh, by a simple uh, uh, inequality like this. So what you, what you end up with is something along these lines. So let me just finish by that. So these are energies at time t1 and at time t0. Uh, and uh, I can prove an estimate like this. Uh, uh, and what you end up with then is, is that uh, a bound along these lines. So this, this kind of estimate bounds the final energy in terms of the initial energy 
uh, and there is a constant here that uh, will be uh, bounded for small a. And so here is again uh, a smallness of a that comes into this argument. And, uh, and so this, this argument relies in several places on smallness of a. And, uh, and uh, as, I, as I explained, uh, this recent work of the Fermat et al., um, uh, which is based on, on Fourier methods and, uh, and also a version of this Whiting's result uh, uh, applies for, for also for large A. And we have not tried seriously to, to extend this result to, to the general situation. Uh, okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is some a very, very impressionistic uh, uh, discussion of the wave equation on Kerr, but what you can get from this by then using, uh, using the Moravitz estimate and conformal vector fields, you can then prove decay estimates. And you can actually, you can, you can at least, uh, um, uh, using those kind of pedestrian techniques, you can get at least 1 over t to the 3 halves uh, decay, uh, and, uh, which is far from optimal. But um, uh, this is this is the the situation. So the the best results that are that we have at the moment give one over t cubed decay, uh, assuming certain black box type estimates, um, and and that uh, that is close to or probably equal to the rate of decay that you can expect uh, uh, for waves in Kerr. Okay, so, so, okay, so I, I went over quite a bit, so, so let, let's take a break and start uh, on this other topic. Thanks. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to switch uh, topics quite a bit. Um, and so I want to explain uh, some aspects of, of spin geometry, uh, which I think are important for uh, understanding higher spin fields. <clears throat> and uh, because uh, if we look at, uh, we're interested in, in uh, black hole stability and uh, of course uh, the scalar wave equation is, a, is an interesting model problem. Uh, it's a massless field and so it has that aspect in common with uh, the Einstein equation, but uh, but uh, if we look at Maxwell or gravity, those are fields with spin. So Maxwell has spin one, gravity has spin two, and uh, and those aspects uh, change the nature of the field equation quite a bit. And uh, so, and so the most effic effective way to 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 uh, to uh, to take that into account seems to be to use the spin geometry. So we have, so we're in we're in now in a, in Lorentzian spa space time. And now, as I said uh, initially, I, I'm going to switch to this signature, and and this is there is no uh, there is no fundamental r difference, but it's in this setting it's it's more natural, and uh, so uh, if we look at Minkowski space, then the the Lorentz group, the connected component of the Lorentz group, has a double cover which is SL2C. Okay, uh, and <coughs> a way to see that concretely is uh, is to, to look at matrices like this.
So let me, yeah, so this is. So those are simply uh, complex uh, complex two by two matrices with determinant one. Uh, and if we if we make this uh, correspondence this by Q, then, then what you find is that the determinant of Q is x0 squared minus x1 squared minus x2 squared minus x3 squared. So this, this is uh, Minkowski in a product, uh, but with signature plus, minus, minus, minus. So that's why it's natural to have that, uh, that in a product. And, and now you see that, uh, that if we act by conjugation uh, by these SL2C elements, then that gives uh, an action of SL2C, which doubles covers uh, the SO31, because that action preserves the determinant, and therefore it, 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 uh, it, double, it will double cover the action of, of the uh, Lorentz group. So, uh, okay. And uh, now, uh, so I said, so here is this, this correspondence, and uh, we can write that as XA is sigma A. A, A prime, uh, where this, these sigma A, those are a collection of, of matrices. So sigma zero, this is the, the identity matrix, and the sigma I are the Pauli matrices. And uh, so you can just identify them from this prescription here. So there, uh, I can I could write them down, but I won't. Uh, so uh, and uh, so uh, those those are called Infeld van der Werden symbols, and they simply uh, they allow you to go from vectors to tensors of C two with C two bar because so C two this is like that. Uh, and this is, this is iso isomorphic to R4 with Minkowski uh, uh, metric uh, complexified. So, so complexified vectors correspond to uh, tensor products of uh, s elements in C2 and C2 bar. And and uh, the C2 and C2 bar, those are the fundamental representations of SL2C. So those are, and those are called spinners. So the spin space, in this case, is C2. And there is another inequivalent uh, rep representation, which is C2 bar. Okay. <coughs> Sorry? This. X A A. Ah yes. Oh, well, yes. Uh, so I, I should also say that uh, that we uh, we can now introduce an uh, a convention that I things with index ha with no prime but capital letter correspond to this spin space. Uh, primed letters refer to this spin space. So this, this is a 
this refers to a tensor product of the, these two uh, spaces. And we can also, and we will often, often write this as x a, a prime, just suppressing that, that infield van der Waerden symbol. <coughs> OK. Uh, and uh, so uh, we can, uh, if I introduce uh, a, a, a spin diod uh, then uh, so let me call this this is called omicron and iota so that's the convention so the, this this is just a basis in c2 and we have a corresponding o a prime iota a prime, which is the basis in C2 bar. Okay. And uh, by, uh, if, we, if we take uh, a rank 1 uh, tensor product, then of course the determinant will be 0. So, so any, any, uh, any expression which, is, which it looks like uh, sort of psi a lambda a prime, this, this corresponds to a vector uh, psi a, let's say, which, which is then going to be null. So once we have these, uh, the diet here, we can form four vectors in a natural way. This will then be a null tetrad uh, okay. uh, and uh, we have the uh, in C2 we have an action of SL2C that, so that means that there is a there's a conserved area element. see here. So <clears throat> uh, there is a, uh, so let's see now, so uh, yeah, so, so it's, so here is an example of a, of a, of a tensor product of spinners. Uh, if we look at, at, uh, at the irreducible representations of uh, SL2C, those are very simple. They, they look like this. Um, And uh, so this, here we have m elements, here we have n elements, and they're symmetric. So irreducible representations of this SL2C uh, are simply symmetric spin tensors. And so that means that uh, there, is a, there is a very simple, uh, you, can, you can find the, the, the correct objects to work with in a, in a very nice way. <coughs> uh, and uh, let's see here. Uh, so uh, and so in particular, uh, using uh, this. Uh, okay. So so we have so we have all these uh, so we have all these spin tensors. Uh, we have the representation of. Uh, the, the action of SL2C on those. So that means that we can form, uh, if we have a spin manifold, 
we can form the, the corresponding spinner bundles. And, and a theorem by Gerock says that any non-compact globally hyperbolic Uh, four manifold is spin. So that means that uh, if we have uh, a globally hyperbolic space time, uh, uh, then we, ha we have a spin structure. So that means that we can use. Uh, the associated bundle construction on M. So, so this means that all of these structures can be lifted to, to M. And uh, also, uh, the, the Levitivita lifts by this construction. So So, uh, so if we have a spinner uh, like this, we can apply a Levitivita covariant derivative to that. To that. Uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, if we have a general spinner, uh, so, uh, so uh, OK, so I should say a few more things. Uh, before going on. So, okay, so uh, a, a couple of, uh, so now, now we have moved this whole machinery to, to, to the space time. Uh, and uh, in the spinner setting, we don't have a metric naturally, but we have this, uh, this volume, this area element, and we can use that to, to raise and lower indices. So if I have some uh, psi a uh, epsilon b a this is uh, psi b and uh, and uh, on the other hand epsilon a b psi b is uh, psi a so I can raise and lower indices on spinners using this uh, this this epsilon matrix uh, and epsilon a b epsilon c b is delta a c. So there's because of this because this is skew, you have to worry about signs, and you can then arrange that uh, that this epsilon is is uh, uh, Something like that, okay, and uh, <clears throat> and we can also uh, do one aspect of this spinner tensor correspondence. So so the the metric has two indices. It's symmetric. Uh, so it's go, it's uh, it is of the form. So each of these tensor indices corresponds to a, a pair of a unprimed and primed uh, spinner index. And uh, this is uh, then equal to to that, and this this fixes the normalization for this epsilon. <coughs> and so, uh, so we we're going to have that this normalization holds. And and once you have that, then this this means that uh, this uh, this. Uh, tetrad that I wrote down here will have the property that L A N A is is one and M A M bar 
A is 1, and all other inner products vanish. Sorry? I think, I think this is the, uh, uh, I think this is the way it's supposed to work. I, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but let, let, okay, let me leave it like that. But uh, there, there's a question mark about the sign. Sorry? Uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so, so one of these, so this is minus one. So, the, so those have, have positive uh, inner product. These have negative inner product. And that goes together with this, uh, this signature here. Yeah. OK, so, uh, so I'm not sure how far I can go today. Uh, uh, OK, so, uh, so we, have, we have this. So now, uh, so as I said, so the, the irreducible representations of SL to C correspond to symmetric spin tensors uh, or, spi uh, or spinners. And, uh, and, and so that means that any spinner, an, an arbitrary spinner, can then be decomposed into, sort, into a sum of terms involving uh, these irreducible representations or symmetric spinners by taking uh, traces with epsilon. So by using epsilon, I can eliminate any non-symmetric part of the spinner. And I can then replace the, the, the general spinner by a sum of, of uh, such irreducible pieces. And uh, of course, the same applies to tensors. Uh, and, uh, and an example of, of an irreducible of, of a tensor which is symmetric is a symmetric two tensor. So, uh, and uh, if I form So when I take the complex conjugate of a spinner, that ends up in the, in the uh, adjoint uh, or conjugate space. And so it, it's going to have primed indices. Uh, so this, this is then, this is a real two form. Uh, So that's an example of a, the correspondence between an irreducible representation or an irreducible piece, so to speak, on the, on the spinner side and uh, an irreducible piece on the tensor side. So uh, skew, skew two forms uh, are one of those examples. And uh, another example is if we look at uh, the, the Riemann tensor, this can be uh, decomposed into uh, a scalar piece or, uh, well, uh, let me not call it lambda, but, but just a, a scalar piece, a traceless piece, and uh, the vial tensor. And so each of these correspond to uh, such an irreducible representation. And in particular, this piece here corresponds to a, a symmetric two tensor, a four tensor. So we have uh, that C A B C D is psi Um, 
Okay, so so uh, and and so this this is called the vial spinner. Okay, and uh, so if we now, so that means that whenever I want to understand uh, the Maxwell field, I can look at such a, a two spinner. Whenever I want to understand uh, the the spin two field or or uh, gravity. I can essentially look at this uh, at this four spinner. <coughs> um, okay. Um, so let's see where, uh, yeah, so, so something that's going to play an important role is the following uh, decomposition. So uh, if we take, we look at uh, this coherent derivative, that's in general not going to be uh, uh, totally symmetric in all indices. But we can, uh, we can decompose this into irreducible pieces. So, okay, so I need some more space. So if, if I take, if I apply a, a, a covariant derivative to an arbitrary spinner, um, I can, uh, I can, I, I will get the following irreducible pieces. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. So, And so, okay, so let me, let me write this. So here we're going to have uh, like that. Uh, sorry, and now I should have uh, messing up so now we have the two indices on the covariant derivative uh, unprimed and primed get contracted into indices on the spinner and this is the divergence uh, the curl is uh, constructed in a similar way, but now we contract one index. Uh, and symmetrize over the rest. So uh, this, this index gets contracted and the rest is symmetrized. Uh, and uh, okay, so let me. Uh, so this uh, this will have indices d to d uh, a prime to d prime. Uh, there is an adjoint operator which I'm not going to write down at the moment. So this this is just got by flipping uh, primed and unprimed indices in this in the definition. And there is a twist operator. And uh, this is got by taking one covariant derivative uh, 
making no contractions. and symmetrizing. So this will have indices now, A prime, D prime, A to D, okay? So, so, so there are these four, uh, so from the covariant derivative, there are these four irreducible uh, pieces. From this covariant derivative, there are these four ir irreducible pieces. And these are, uh, we can call those fundamental operators. And these are related to what's known as Stein-Weiss operators. And uh, for example, uh, if you look at, at the Maxwell equation, uh, if we take uh, 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 a complex two form, which is F A B. So script F is is like that. So I take the, a real two form, it take its uh, dual and minus I times that. So I is the, the, the square root of minus one. Then uh, then the, the Maxwell equation becomes uh, so, so that object is 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 something like phi a b epsilon a prime b prime, and uh, and the Maxwell equation in this setting is just d f a b. This is, corresponds to uh, d f. Uh, so just sorry, uh, I'm I'm going. Yeah. Yes. So it's just uh, flipping uh, the, yeah. Um, OK, so let's see. So, so what I want to say is that, uh, is that the, so this is another example of this spinner tensor co correspondence. So uh, an anti-self-dual uh, complex two form is got in this simple way. So, so in, in a certain sense, uh, in, in, in Lorentzian geometry, complex anti-self-dual two forms are more natural uh, to, to work with in, uh, than, than real two forms, because they correspond in a simpler way to spinners. Uh, and so what, what I really wanted to say is that if we, if we look at the, the Maxwell equation, in, for, for such a such a complex anti self dual two form then then uh, that equation is simply uh, so well so it's it's simply this you can check so if I, so I only need one deriv one of the maxwell equation normally I would say d f is zero divergence of f is zero but since we have a, 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 a an anti-self-dual form, uh, we only need one equation. And if we project this, uh, or so we decompose this into spinner equations, then what we, what we end up with is this, this corresponds to this equation. Uh, ah. Like that, and uh, now if I did it correctly, uh, since so phi has no unprimed indices, and uh, and so what what we see is that this is just this curl operation. So, so, uh, so the Maxwell equation, in effect, any, uh, so, 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 uh, and so the Maxwell equation. This is the spin one equation, and the spin s equation. This is where we have here. 
two S indices, symmetric. Uh, and, uh, and all of those are examples of, of uh, an equation which is simply, uh, and th those are both examples of, of an equation which is just curl phi equal to zero. So this, this is the spin S equation. And so for spin one, we have Maxwell. For spin two, we have, we have uh, the Bian this is the Bianchi system. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, let's see when I should I should officially end at twelve fifteen, right? Um, so uh, okay. So. So this this is the, the the so the curl operator is associated to the spin s equation. This is the essentially some kind of formal adjoint of that. Uh, the divergence is is what you're familiar with, and uh, the twist is is the new object, so to speak. And 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 the, uh, now if if we're in a non-trivial So if we're in a non-conformally flat space, then, then uh, the spin S equation for S greater than 1 is, uh, has algebraic constraints. So, so it's it, so that's not in general not an interesting field equation, uh, the the spin s equation the way I wrote it. There are other higher spin equations which I, I'm not going to talk about. So, uh, so the general spin s equation for s greater than one is not interesting. However, uh, the the important solution to the spin two equation in a general space time is of course the Weyl spinner itself. So, if you're in a, in a general vacuum space time. Uh, the Weyl spinner will satisfy the spin two equation, and, and essentially, any solution of if you're in a sufficiently general space time, the 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 solution of the spin two equation is essentially proportional to the Weyl spinner. So so that uh, is an un, uh, that's interesting from a certain point of view, but to study the spin two equation on its own in a general space time is is it is it, it, not what you want to do. Uh, okay, uh, but what I wanted to say, so, so this is an example of such uh, additional constraints that you get if you, if you, you can get these by, uh, by, by looking at the, the spin S equation, applying further derivatives and commuting derivatives. And the twist equation, uh, If we look at that uh, as an example, uh, so for if, if we take a valence two, two spinner, so uh, let me call the valence simply, uh, the valence of a spinner is simply uh, the number of unprimed and primed indices. So, so uh, a valence two spinner would be something like this. Uh, uh, and if I apply the twist operator to that, this is the equation I get. So if I take this expression here and, and specialize to the case where there are no uh, unprimed indices on the spinner, then this is the equation I get. And this implies that um, uh, that if you apply another derivative and, and commute derivatives, what you f find is that uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I should do it like this. Okay, 
so so there is a there is a constraint that relates in an algebraic manner the curvature spinner and this object kappa. Uh, so a, a solution of, to the to this twist equation is called a killing spinner. And I'll come back to that. So that will play a very important role. So a general solution of the twist equal to zero equation is called a killing spinner. And in general, a space time with, uh, which contains or which admits a killing spinner uh, has curvature which satisfies uh, restriction. And, and so what you can show in, in the vacuum case is that um, or well, uh, so th this this means that uh, in particular the the space time is algebraically special. And in particular, it's it's Petrov um, and uh, uh, it's Petrov type uh, d n or o. And I will ex explain in a minute what what those are. Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, okay, so so we have these so we have these uh, these fundamental spinners f fundamental operators. Uh, I explained that we have these uh, additional constraints, and uh, now uh, let uh, let me explain how to how to do this uh, Petrov classification. So, uh, if I have a general spinner, then uh, then uh, in, then there will be some some one spinners. Such that this holds. So this is just the, the uh, this is essentially just the fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, so any symmetric spinner any symmetric spinner can be decomposed into principal spinners or principal null directions like that. So uh, remember, so each, each one spinner, if I, if I multiply that by another one spinner, that gives me a null vector. So in some sense, each, uh, each uh, one spinner corresponds to uh, what Penrose calls a null flag. So that co it corresponds to some, some family of null planes. Uh, and, uh, and that's why you can call these null principal null directions or principal spinners. Uh, so every, every symmetric spinner can be decomposed like that. So if we look at, at, the, pet at the vial spinner, this is going to be something like like that. So there will be four, in general, four individual uh, principal spinners in the vial spinner. And uh, now, now I can simply, uh, uh, so now the Petrov types of this uh, spinner, psi, They will be as follows. So, so there's there are two types of terminology. So here we have uh, so this is the the case where we have 
alpha a beta b gamma c delta d. Uh, and then we can specialize this to type 2, which is 2, 1, 1. And here we have alpha a alpha b gamma c uh, delta d. So now we have those two are equal. So we have specialized. Uh, and then we can have type d, which is 2, 2. Uh, and, and then we have alpha a alpha b beta a beta uh, uh, beta C, beta D, like that. So now we have two separate null spinners, principal spinners, which are, which are repeated. So the each is twice repeated. Just uh, one single four times repeated uh, uh, principal spinner, and then all that's all. The, the only possibility that's left is the is conformally flat. So so psi is equal to zero, right? So uh, so if. if uh, So we see here that that uh, so this is this is general. This is the general. No restriction, and all of these others are algebraically special. Uh, this is where you find Kerr and Schwarzschild, uh, and. Uh, and there is, a, there is a, you can draw a diagram. Uh, I'm not sure if I can get this uh, right. So, we, so I can specialize from one to two, uh, and from two to D. And I can also go from, from two to three, and from three to N. Uh, and from from D to N, and from that I can go to to type O, something like that. So so th th this is this is a specialization diagram, and you can see that that somehow I mentioned uh, here that uh, if we have a, a, a killing spinner. Uh, a valence two killing spinner. I have <coughs> so a solution to this equation by applying another derivative and commuting derivatives. We get this constraint on the curvature spinner. Uh, and if I pick alpha and beta to be the principal spinner spinners of kappa, then then you can uh, then it's it's quite easy to see that. That the only principal spinners in uh, in in psi have to be contained as principal spinners in in kappa, so that means that psi has at most two principal spinners. So therefore, it has to be one of these in one of these uh, Petrov types. So that that explains what I said over there. Uh, Okay, and uh, okay, so so where do we go from from here? Uh, so so a very important uh, uh, 
point which I'll, I'll get back to, which I'll talk about uh, next time, is that uh, once we have once we have a tetrad, uh, so one, once we have a, a dyad, this means that we can uh, we have a, we also have a, a tetrad L N M M bar. And so this means that we can we can project on the tetrad or dyad if we're projecting spinners. And so we can go from, from spin, general spinners to spin to components of spinners, and we can uh, replace uh, the information in the connection by uh, spin coefficients. Uh, um, so, so uh, the the Cartan structure equations can be encoded into into uh, scalar components when you project when you when you look at the uh, at the at the connection coefficients in in a tetrad and as i said uh, sometime uh, if you if you have an orthonormal tetrad i maybe i didn't say it but if you have an orthonormal tetrad or a null tetrad you have 24 such uh, components so that's uh, still a large number uh, if you count those up to complex conjugation, you have 12. So that's still a fairly large number. Uh, but if you introduce the following uh, operations, uh, so the prime operation, well, OK, so let, let me not get, get ahead of myself. Uh, OK, so, 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 we have, so we have these uh, spin coefficients. So there are 24 uh, complex. Uh, such spin coefficients, and uh, if we look at at uh, at the the Maxwell field, we can project that to a collection of scalars uh, uh, and then So the, the index here represents the number of iotas that you have inserted. So for the, for, this, for the Maxwell field, there are three different ways numbered from 0, 1, and 2. Uh, for, the, for the vial spinner, we have psi 0, which is psi a, b, c, d, o, a. O, B, O, C, O, D, and so on. So those are, uh, so the, those are four, th those give me five scalars that represent uh, the vial curvature. Okay, um, so, so, uh, once we have chosen a dyad, uh, we can uh, represent our spinner fields and connection coefficients in terms of such scalars. <clears throat> and, and the important point here is that uh, if we're in an algebraically special space-time, in particular uh, in a type D space-time, then uh, the Goldberg-Sachs theorem uh, can be used. Uh, or uh, applies. So the Goldberg-Sachs theorem says that
So a repeated principal null direction um, is shear free and geodesic. Okay, and so so what that means is that uh, if I if 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 O A is is a repeated principal null direction, that means that uh, that psi zero and psi one vanish. So in particular, if you're in type D, you have two of these, and uh, that means that of out of these five uh, complex uh, scalars representing the, the vial tensor, uh, then then uh, only the psi two is is non-vanishing. Okay. So and this this is the fact in in Kerr. So in Kerr. If you uh, you pick the the principal null directions uh, that I wrote down, uh, so so I wrote down the Kinnersley tetra. The L and N are principal null uh, directions. You pick uh, the corresponding spin diode, uh, and you calculate the these uh, scalars. What you find is that the psi two is minus m over r minus i a cosine theta cubed. So this is this is the this is the this is the the value of that uh, remaining uh, scalar in in Borel-Linquist coordinates. Uh, so, so this is the only remaining piece of, of the curvature in, in, in Kerr once you have made these simplifications. And, uh, and also, uh, out of these four, 24 uh, coefficients that represent the connection form, uh, well, so I, I, I said that uh, we can introduce uh, some simplifying symmetry operations. Uh, so let's see. Well, I should finish in a few minutes. Uh, uh, so if we, so let me just say, finish by saying the following. So if we introduce the following symmetry operations, uh, prime, which is switches L to N, M to M bar. And, uh, well, this is just complex conjugate. Then, uh, if we, so if we write our expressions modulo these uh, symmetry operations, then uh, what you find is that, uh, so we had, we start with 24 uh, up to conjugate, the, there are 12, but up to prime there are six such uh, coefficients left in the, uh, so, so up to prime and conjugation, we have six, uh, spin coefficients, and so th those you can give names. So they are called rho, um, uh, tau, sigma, kappa, epsilon, and beta. And I, I'll explain uh, something. So this is the, this is like the complex divergence. This uh, this is the shear. This is um, uh, expresses whether the the vector is geodetic. And this is uh, related to something that Penrose calls abreastness. And don't ask me to explain perfectly what, what that means. Uh, and, and I mean, so this, this version of a tetrad formalism, I should say, 
is, is, uh, is somewhat popular among a certain community and less popular among a certain other community. <laughs> And and uh, and and uh, I guess the the case is open. Uh, so probably one one should learn to use um, uh, the the formalism or method that's best adapted to the problem at hand. Um, but but there is uh, I've somehow grown to like this. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, okay. So so uh, by by and and so now this is in a general situation. And in type D, uh, those uh, vanish. So if we're in an exact type D space time, then, uh, then those two vanish. And what we're left with is rho, rho prime, tau, and tau prime, and their conjugate. And that means that uh, that the, the the Maxwell equation and and um, and the Bianchi equation simplify drastically, and and can be uh, can be analyzed, so to speak. Um, okay. So I think, and so so let yeah, so let me finish by saying saying one more thing about type D, and this is the this is the following fact. So I said that if you have a killing spinner, then, then you're in type D, N, or O. On the other hand, if you're in type D, then uh, the following spinner So, so, uh, so I pick these omicron and iota to be uh, aligned with the principal null directions. I rescale by the negative one third power of the remaining curvature scalar. So this would be just uh, something that's proportional to one over r minus i a cosine theta, uh, and then this combination uh, has twist zero. And so that, that's somehow the, the thing that opens up uh, the, the curve geometry, these, these facts. And, and, and tomorrow I'll try to explain something how, to, how that can be used. Thanks.